Uh, my name is Judy Brown, and I'd like to greet everyone, give everyone a nice good evening, and welcome you to our presentation this evening. I am a director for Region 5 of the Indiana Forestry Woodland Owners Association and also a forest woodland owner. My husband, Doug, and I own two different woodland tracks. One is a tract in uh, Dubois County and another in Jefferson County. We do have management plans for both tracks and we have been doing harvests. We've been doing post-harvest timber stand improvement, and we work to, work to control invasive species. We've under, underplanted oak trees in our tracks, and we've also done a pollinator planting, and Doug cuts firewood on the property as well. But while we don't hunt, we do allow others to use the property to deer hunt to keep the deer population in check. We find that the tracks are great places to go in mushroom season. And if we ever want a peaceful walk on a Sunday afternoon, we enjoy doing that as well. The Indiana Forestry Woodland Owners Association educates about and advocates for responsible forest conservation and management. We support scientific best practices to achieve objectives of clean water, wildlife habitat, mm -hmm. soil protection, native species diversity, timber production, recreation, carbon sequestration, and many others. Membership is available to woodland owners or anyone interested in forestry. We provide fundamental learning opportunities, such as webinars like you're attending tonight, forestry field days, and workshops. We represent, we represent um, the woodland owner's interests at the state legislature and with state agencies. And we share regional and nas national resources through our affiliation with the National Woodland Owners Association. Please visit our website to learn more about IFWA. At this time, I'd like to introduce Liz Jackson, the executive director of IFWA. Thank you, Judy, and welcome everyone. We're excited to have you join us tonight to hear from Michael Hamoya about wild orchids of Indiana. Before I pass to him, I'd like to remind you to keep your microphone muted at all times. Also, please keep your video off during his presentation to limit distractions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box at any time and I'll moderate your question at the end. This presentation will be recorded and announced when it is available. Michael Homoya served as botanist and plant ecologist for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Division of Nature Preserves for 37 years before retiring in 2019. He's written over 75 scientific papers, popular articles, and books about Indiana's natural features, including orchids of Indiana, wildflowers and ferns of Indiana forests, a field guide, wake up, woods, and wildflowers of the Midwest. He's a fellow and former president of the Indiana Academy of Science and the Indiana Native Plant Society. Now I'll hand it over to Michael, who will join, who's joining us tonight from the sunny state of Florida. Thank you very much, Liz. And greetings to you all. I hope you're having a wonderful evening. And I also hope that uh, I can convince you this evening that orchids are the most amazing, wonderful group of plants in the world. At least that's my opinion. Full disclosure, the title, Indiana's Native Orchids, I hope you're not thinking that I'm going to be talking about ones that uh, you've seen in the, your box stores for sale or in the grocery stores or in greenhouses. These are truly wild native orchids and they're the real deal. They're not something that just looks like an orchid. They truly are the real thing. Before we get too deep into what an orchid is and all the variety that you can see in Indiana, I'll just tell you a little bit of story of my first encounter with a native orchid. And it was way back in uh, high school, actually. I was with a, a friend of a friend of my mother's and uh, she and several of us were on a hike in a deep sandstone canyon in Southern Illinois. And it was in the winter, believe it or not, in the winter where we saw this, this plant, this orchid, and it was as foggy as could be. So it really added sort of this mystical uh, atmosphere 
to that experience. And this was it. <laughs> May not look like much to you, and of course it isn't in bloom, but it is a true orchid. And I'll talk a little bit more about this plant. But when this uh, gentleman pointed it out, I thought, can this really be a true native orchid? I mean, my thinking was, you either have to see them in a greenhouse or you have to go to the tropics. But uh, I certainly sir, soon learned differently. So let's talk about the orchid family. I'm a, I'm a big believer in learning the etymology of words. And in this case, the uh, word is orcus, which, uh, from which we get the name orchid. And it has a Greek uh, derivation, which believe it or not, literally means testicle. And you might think, well, how can that be? Well, maybe enough is said here in this illustration, but this is the genus Orcus ustulatus, which is a, a, a European species. And uh, well, you can, you can uh, see for yourself, I guess, how this, this family got its name, believe it or not. I'm not making this stuff up. Now, orchids come in all shapes and sizes, and many of them actually look like some particular animal or insect, such as this one. This is one I have to happen to have had the pleasure to see in Europe, and it's called a bee orchid. And perhaps you can see here in looking at it that it does bear some resemblance to a bee. And Darwin studied this orchid. And uh, it was thought that perhaps there was some form of attraction to a bee, a potential pollinator, that would transform or transport pollen from one plant or one flower to the other in the form of what's called, well, believe it or not, pseudocopulation or mating with that imitator of a flower. Well, in fact, this particular species, uh, as it turns out, is actually self-pollinating, but uh, in, 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 in the UK it is at least, further south in its range in Southern Europe and, and Northern Africa, I guess bees are indeed involved, involved with the pollination of the species. Now here's one that's called the butterfly orchid. And some have speculated that butterflies would pollinate the species, but of all the research I've been able to do, uh, I've not found any evidence whatsoever that that's the case, but it is a spectacular looking orchid. This one is known primarily uh, in South America and then also in Trinidad, which is where I had the great pleasure of seeing it. So what do you think this looks like? Well, you might have guessed, it looks somewhat like a duck and I can assure you ducks are not involved in the pollination of this species. It's an Australian species, but I, th I think God must have a sense of humor when he makes a flower that looks like this. <laughs> uh, that's the most amazing looking orchid or plant of any sort that I can think of. And the next one, believe it or not, is uh, a crowd favorite. And it's this thing, it's a true orchid, and here it is. The naked man orchid. True thing, it's a Mediterranean species. You don't have to use much imagination here. Okay, we've talked about the great diversity and variety of orchids. Some think there's many as 35,000 different species of orchids across the world on all continents except Antarctica. There's been some debate about whether it's the largest in terms of species, numbers of species, but I will go along with this statistic just because I'm a fan of orchids, but they're mostly tropical, but they occur all over the world, again, except Antarctica, but they do go above the Arctic Circle in the Northern Hemisphere. And they, found, they can be found in the driest of habitats and the wettest of habitats. They're mostly epiphytic, which means that they grow on the branches of other or stems, leaves, whatever, trunk of other plants. Epi meaning upon and phytic meaning plant, so upon other plants. The others are terrestrial, which means they grow in the soil. And all of Indiana's are terrestrial species. Their, their roots are in the soil. But let's look where 
most of the orchids are found and that is indeed in the tropics and in, especially in cloud forests where it's constantly moist and cool. This is a, a, a shot showing this tree and you can see the different branches of this tree and all these other plants that are growing upon it. And that's where a lot of native orchids for the tropics can be found. But you don't have to go that far. You can go to southern Florida. Actually, there's one species that even gets up into the Carolinas that's epiphytic. That is, it grows on the trunks and branches of, uh, of trees in this case. And this is the Florida butterfly orchid. So what makes an orchid an orchid? Let's look at its, its, its basic parts, the morphology of the flower. And I've got a little phrase here I call third petal of the sun, from the sun. And you'll wonder where'd that come from? Well, I'll show you. Flowers are three parted. They have three sepals and three petals. If you're not familiar with that, you know what petals look like, but sepals are, if you were to see a flower in bud, the outermost covering of that bud typically is made up of sepals. And when the flower opens, they're going to be below the petals. And I'll show you here in just a second. One of those three petals of the orchid is modified into what's called a lip. And it's usually very different in shape than the other two. And it's positioned lowermost. And then also important is that the stamen and pistil, that is the male and female parts, are fused to form a column. So here in the illustration, you can see these different parts. There's a sepal, there's a sepal, and here is a sepal. Then those are the three. Then here's a petal, there's a petal, and here's that third one. It's lowermost, typically, and we'll look at an exception, typically lowermost and of a different shape and color than the other two petals. And then here's the column. That's the reproductive part of the plant. So here's the, uh, the thing about that phrase, third petal from the sun, if you bear with me. I was having too much fun putting this PowerPoint together, as you can see. Here are the two petals, and then here's that third one. And, and as it's positioned here, the sun above in the sky, the petal is lowermost. It's the, the farthest one away of the petals from the sun. Yep, too much fun. And here's the, here is the, what's called a column. And the pollinia is where there are pollen grains in a, a, a cohesive mass. So it's, it's actually somewhat solid. And that is uh, where the, the, the pollen, the male part of the flower is located. And insects are often involved in the transport of pollen from one flower to the next. This is a lady's tresses orchid. And here's a bee and you can see the pollinia plural for pollinium. So there are two of them here. So they're pollinia stuck on the head of this bee, which had picked it up from this flower and now is going to visit another flower. And that pollen, those pollinia will stick to the stigmatic surface, the female part where, the, uh, where it will then depart from the, the bee's head. So bees are often important pollinators of orchids as are butterflies and but even uh, 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 hummingbirds in Indiana can transport pollen. The ovaries inferior, which means it's below the flowers, petals, and sepals, and the seeds are numerous. There could be tens of thousands of seeds in one capsule, and they're extremely small. They're dust-like. If you were to put a bunch of them in your, in your hand, you could blow them, and they just blow with the wind. And that's how they get transported into the environment. They have little or no nutritive value to them. So upon landing in a suitable substrate or soil, let's say, in order for it to germinate, it has no, no real energy there to start growth. Think of a bean, you know, the two halves of, the, of a bean seed, which as they start to grow, they're called seed leaves or cotyledons. That's a lot of food there available for that growing plant. Orchids don't have that. So they must get energy from somewhere and they do it from a fungus. It's a fungal association with the germinating seed. It's called a mycorrhizal association. And that therefore 
gives it that that necessary energy for that newly growing orchid plant. But that rarely happens successfully. That's why they produce so many seeds. It may be only one out of those 10,000 seeds that actually will ultimately develop into a full-sized plant. Okay, I bet you've all seen these. You've probably seen them in Lowe's or other big box stores, nurseries, even grocery stores. This is called a moth orchid. Uh, Phalaenopsis, Phalaenopsis is the genus. It's tropical, it's an Asian tropical plant. But let's just refresh our memory now about the orchid flower morphology. There's one sepal, there's one and one, two, and three. There's a petal, there's a petal, and this oddly looking structure here is that third petal. One petal, two petal, three, and there's the column. And we'll look in more detail at some of the native orchids and you'll see it has that same pattern. There I grew up, a little quote from Abraham Lincoln. You know, he had his formative years in Southern Indiana. Always have to keep that in mind. He's Abe may be claimed to be an Illinoisan, but uh, he, he grew up in Indiana. And or Indiana is a great place for orchids, or at least it was, uh, more so at least than it is today. Uh, here's someone, 1881, probably as good a place to study and collect hardy orchids as there is in America, is the low and wet prairies of the Calumet, Kankakee, Calumet, St. Joseph, and other rivers of Northern Indiana. Uh, and that definitely is the case. That is a great area to go see orchids, but practically every county in Indiana, I'm sure formerly at least, had at least one species of orchid. And I would dare to say they still, every county would have at least one orchid, wild orchid that could be found. Let's look at Indiana as, a, as an environment for, oh, let's see, there we go. Here's the different parts of the state. And I've split it into four regions, Northern, Western, Eastern, and Southern. And we get an influence from all those different directions of our continent that supply us with a variety of different orchids. Indiana is an ecological mashup. So of our, occurrence of orchids, 50% of them occur in forest, 35% in saturated peatlands, and we'll look at that uh, kind of community in a little bit, and in 15% in grasslands. Here's the forest. We'll look at the forest first, and most of Indiana was forested. Over three quarters of it was, or at least woodland, which is maybe not as densely forested, but uh, nonetheless had trees. And there are moist forests, which is probably where most of the native forest orchids occur. Mesic upland forest, it's well-drained, it's moist, it's not too dry, too wet. Beech trees, American beech trees is a sort of a keystone species of that environment. It's, uh, it's very typical of mesic upland forest. Dry forest where you can find things, uh, white oak and chestnut oak and different hickories would be in the dry forest, wet, uh, or you might find sycamore and cottonwood and, and uh, also various species of oaks and hickories as well. Sphagnum bog, that's where it is a, a, a basically a floating mat. It's acidic in nature. It's composed of, de of living and decaying sphagnum moss. And upon there, you'll find a number of acid-loving plants, including orchids. Then there is the fin, which is a saturated uh, organic soil community where uh, there's water percolating to the surface, groundwater. Keeps it constantly moist, even in the driest of times. In Indiana, they're usually alkaline. So you've got your acid bogs, and then you've got your alkaline fins. And then prairie grasslands and well, those even old fields, uh, open, totally open, a few or uh, any trees in them. So all those habitats will have orchids. Here's a slice of a hypothetical site that you might find in northern Indiana and where all the orchids could be positioned in their appropriate habitats. And that was for northern Indiana. And here it is in southern Indiana. 
you can see where we're up at the driest of sites and then we work our way down where it gets more moist, even into the acidic seep springs and then floodplain forests. So they all have their own little niche of where they grow. Some grow in more habitat types than others. Some are very specific as to where they'll grow. So we have 45 species native to the state, including one introduced exotic. It came from Europe, intentionally introduced. At least one in every county, there are 92 counties, all are terrestrial. Remember I said they're in soil, the roots are. And most are small. That's why I think many people are unaware that we have orchids. There are two main reasons why people are unaware of our orchids here in Indiana. One is that they're not sure exactly what it is that makes an orchid an orchid. And two, they're often small and inconspicuous, but there are exceptions and you'll see in a moment. They bloom from the very earliest of spring, early April. You can see this is a chart showing the flowering dates, the blooming dates of various, the various species in Indiana. And it goes all the way into early November. Now there's no species that grows the entire growing season. They divide themselves up as you can see here. Uh, late May and early June is a big time to see most many of the orchids. So let's take a look at them. One of my favorites, this, uh, this is again, uh, how it's, it's etymology at work. This is Kypris, goddess of love and beauty. And that is the, uh, what was given the name of its Latin genus, Cypripedium, the large yellow lady cypress, Cypripedium parviflorum variety pubescens. And here it is, it's the yellow lip of that flower is like a pouch or a slipper, hence lady slipper. Here's one that has a white slipper. So it's a different species altogether, primarily a prairie species. And it's the small white lady slipper, Cypripedium candidum. Mostly uh, gone in Indiana. I'm sure it was at one time common, but because of its habitat, having been converted almost entirely to agricultural pursuits, has good rich soil, as you all know. So there's very little quality prairie left for this species to occur. This is the pink lady slipper, Cypripedium acaulei, also very rare in Indiana. And in Indiana it's only in the far northern counties. This is the showy lady slipper and by far the largest of all our native orchids. It can stand in some cases upwards towards three feet in height. So it is an impressively big orchid. It grows in very saturated, soupy, mucky soils. And uh, not an easy one to, find, to walk out to to see because of that. Most people would describe that community as a swamp. Uh, technically, I wouldn't. I'd call it more of a fin environment, but it's very soupy. And uh, some people think of it as uh, somewhat quicksand-like because you can get stuck in it. But it's worth the effort to see it if you have an opportunity. Here it is a little bit closer. Just a beautiful, beautiful native orchid. Each lip that you can see there, the pinkish lip, is uh, maybe the size of a, a ping pong ball or maybe a small lemon, something like that. Synchronicity. I'm talking about an orchid that blooms synchronously. This is it, the three birds orchid. This one looks a lot to me like some of the tropical species you'll see uh, in terms of its, its overall shape. Three birds orchid because it often has three flowers, uh, Trifera trianthophora. And here is where you'll find a case where it's often frustrating when you come across a population of these plants and they're not in bloom. This one we just missed, as you can see, those flowers are starting to close up. So we missed them in bloom and we couldn't find a single plant. And we found several of them that did not have flowers on. I mean, they had flowers, but they weren't in good condition. This was on August the 1st. Well, we're, we do know that in a given population, when one plant's flower has a flower that opens, all of them do. And then when they, one closes, 
they all close, but it's not just for a day. I mean, they, they just last for a day, each flower. But then there's a period of days where none of them can be found open. Well, we went back to a different site three days later, and there we did see, excuse me, we did see them in flower three days later. And here's where social media provided a little interesting piece of data. Elsewhere in the state, on that same date, they were all in flower. Every population that people had been seeing had flowers open. But previously, on the days before, none of the plant flowers on any of the populations were open. So this is really kind of an interesting phenomenon. And it makes it difficult to find, to time out, to see exactly when you can see an open flower. Contrarians, these are ones that don't follow the rules. Here are leaves of an orchid called the putty root orchid. And there are no flowers to be seen here. These leaves, instead of coming up in the spring, growing through the summer and dying down in the fall, like most plants, normal plants do, these send their leaves up in the fall they persist through the winter and then die down in spring. Now, the advantage that gives it is that there's no competition for light. Now, of course, it's in the winter and often days are cloudy, but it gives it just enough light that it's able to photosynthesize and, and capture enough light energy to grow. And uh, so this is the time of year to go look for this plant, look for these leaves. In the spring, when all the other plants are up and when this plant does flower, it's more difficult to find. But here's what it looks like when it's in flower. It's a stalk with several flowers on them. Each one is about the size, I would say, of a nickel in diameter. Here is an illustration showing, again, that it is a true orchid. The three sepals, one, two, three. Three petals, one, two, three. And the third one is lowermost and differently shaped. And there's the column. They're back there. You can see all those parts if you look on that photo. Here's another one that doesn't follow the rules. This one is the they call it grass pink. It's not a grass. It just because it has grass-like leaves, and pink because it's typical flower color. But the lip, which is not lowermost, is uppermost. This is the lip petal. And you see the yellow looking stuff here, the little sort of filamentous structures that are looking somewhat like anthers with pollen. Well, that's really a decoy. Here's one that is an odd one in that it's white, but it's, it's really an excellent depiction of that flower. Uh, by the way, many of these pictures you're looking at are from Lee Casebeer, where, where or so I've credited. And uh, Here's just a magnificent picture here, but when a suitable pollinator, in this case, a large bee lands thinking that this is going to be a reward of pollen, there's a hinge at the base of this lip. And when that bee lands on this, this, this lip, starts to look for real pollen there where there isn't any to be found, that hinge bends, gives way, brings the bee back to hit the true column here, and it sticks to the back of the bee, and then it stays there, and then the bee goes to the next flower, and same thing happens, and pollination takes place. So it's like a, sort of an ingenious way, maybe a, a tricky way, to have your pollen transported around from one to flower to the next. Orchids on the move, these are ones that have been increasing its range. One example I provided here is called the crane fly orchid, tipulary discolor. Like the, like the putty root, leaves come up in the fall, persist through the winter, and then disappear in spring. So it just has a single leaf, just like the putty root just has a single leaf. And here are the flowers that come up in late summer. 
So there's not a hint of any leaves on it. And you think, well, where are the leaves? Well, they're not evident, not this time of year, not in, in the summer when it blooms at least, because they come up in the fall. So this has somewhat of a fanciful, fanciful look of a crane fly, swarm of crane flies, at least according to someone who named it. And interestingly, here's a picture of a crane fly and its genus is Tipula. Well, the person that named the orchid thought it looked enough like that crane fly that they even gave it its Latin name, Latin genus name, Tipularia, in order or in, in reference to the crane fly genus name, crane fly orchid. Now, I say it's on the move because from my research, this is the, the pre-1950 distribution of this orchid in blue. Since that time, it has spread considerably westward. It was first found in Southern Illinois in the 60s, never been known prior to that. And now it's sort of marched along out westward. So it's kind of an odd, it's moving from east to west. And I have no idea how those plants got up there, but remember that does have powder-like, dust-like seeds. So for some, some stretch, somehow some seeds made it up there. And the oval lady's tresses, which is a, a species of, of a fall blooming orchid, at least this one is. There's the pre-1950 distribution in blue. And then look how it spread since then. And it's even, you know, snout up in Michigan and Wisconsin, well over into Iowa. So it's pretty interesting. In many cases, our, our flora is dynamic. Some things have that capability of movement and, uh, in this case, this orchid is also well adapted to somewhat disturbed sites. So it's, a, uh, you know, we have a lot of disturbed sites around. So especially uh, like edge habitats, it will colonize those edge habitats as well as, as uh, more mature woods as, uh, in addition to that. Ain't from around here, are you, mister? Well, here I'm talking about an introduction of a species that was not historically known in North America. Uh, this is the broadleaf Helleborine, Epipactus Helleborini. And it was introduced, it was thought maybe as some medicinal, had some medicinal uses from Europe. Here's a map showing its distribution, all in solid here is where it is, where it is well entrenched. The dots show where it is scattered, but it's even out on the West Coast. I saw some in a, in a magnificent redwood forest a few years ago. But here's distribution is in Indiana. Back uh, when Charles Deem, who wrote the, 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 the magnum opus of botany for Indiana, uh, in 1940 published The Flora of Indiana. And he just had, uh, I think, one or two counties up here in far northwest Indiana. And now you can see where the dots are. That's where they are in these various counties including Indianapolis. And uh, it's, it, uh, I even saw one growing on, a, on a, a boulevard in downtown Indianapolis. So it's, it's moving, it's getting around. It uh, will be coming to a, a town near you, I think, eventually. Fortunately, it's not the most aggressive weed I've ever seen, but it is an orchid, so what the heck, I give it a pass. <laughs> I'm singing in the rain. Well, not I didn't misspell that. I'm not talking about R-A-I-N-E, I'm talking about R-E-I-N. How did I spell the rain? R-A-I-N. R-A-I-N, of course. It's the spur of rain. This is the Platanthera genus. And that's, you think of rains like on a, uh, on a, on a buggy or on a horse where you'll ride, and that's the R-E-I-N rain. Here's that big spur, usually filled with nectar. So pollinators are interested in that. And you can see, yeah, there's a there's a spur of, the, of an adjacent flower. But this is the ragged fringed orchid. I also call it the green fringed orchid, Platanthera lacera. Look how fringed that lip is. That's all one petal right there, just extremely fringed. Here's the orange fringe, certainly one of the more colorful of our native orchids. Looks like torches 
this full of these flowers uh, in bloom at one time or, or present quite a, a, a spectacular sight. This is Platantha ciliaris and cilia, meaning hair-like. And you can see the fringed hair-like structures coming from the lip of that petal. The small purple fringed, again, very fringed, one right there. So there's one lip, one petal. There's a petal. There's a petal, and the sepals are back here behind all of that. There is the column, purple fringed orchid. There's Platanthera of Paramina. This is in the south. Psychotes is a northern Indiana species. This one is in southern Indiana. It's called the purple fringeless orchid. Not deeply fringed, just somewhat a little bit ragged along the edge of the lobes of that flower petal. It's often confused with wild flocks that uh, bloom at about the same time uh, in southern Indiana. And fortunately, it's not all that uncommon of an orchid in the south. So, dark seekers. My life is a mycoheterotroph. There's a fancy word for you. I'll break it down. Myco is referring to fungus. Hetero is referring to other, something other than itself. Troph means to feed. So something here is something is feeding on a fungus in a, in a crude sense. And some orchids rely on a fungal connection to get us nutrition, to get us energy that in turn, the fungus being connected to a green plant. And I'll show you a diagram of how that works. So here's a green plant with green leaves. It's capturing light energy. And the energy is collected here, moves down the stalk of the plant, the main stem, into its roots. And this light blue here is the fungal strand that's connected to the roots of the green plant. And then it is taken up by, in this case in blue, the orchid. So there's the pathway from green plant down into the roots, into the fungus, into the orchid. So that makes the orchid a mycoheterotroph. It's getting its food from the fungus. But technically, the energy is really coming from the green plant. And a group of orchids that are like that are the coral root orchids. So named because of the coral-like coral, coral -like structure of its rhizomes. Not truly roots, but we'll call them roots for this purpose. And here's the spring coral root, one of the earliest of our blooming orchids. And notice here that there's no green pigmentation, no leaves. And in essence, its life is underground. And it could stay happy there forever, really. And we wouldn't even know it. It only appears above ground when it flowers for the purpose of reproduction by producing seeds. So it's a fascinating plant. And there are others. This one's called the autumn coral root. Now it does have a little bit of chlorophyll, so it must be able to generate a little bit of its energy, but mostly it comes from that fungus. I christen this the homeliest of all of our native orchids. What you see here is generally what you get 99% of the time. Those flowers don't really open. It's self-pollinating. So there's really no purpose, as far as it's concerned, to attract a pollinator. So we call that condition, or that plant, a has, it's a cleistogamous plant, having the flowers remaining closed when blooming, pre even preventing deposit of pollen from other flowers. Thus, self-pollination is possible. If you break that word down, it's like a shut marriage. Those, those flowers have no purpose to be married to anyone else, at least a pollinator. Crested coral root, one of my favorites. This is a tall, somewhat succulent plant. Again, has no uh, green leaves whatsoever. It's, and this, this is the coloration it is very succulent, very fleshy. Uh, it stands about a foot to two in height and it grows in some of the driest environments. This is in Southern Indiana. It's the only place you can find it 
uh, in South Central Indiana, of the whole, entire state, real rocky and dry. Uh, some cases so dry that trees won't even grow, at least not very well. But it is rich in, in many numbers of, of species of plants, not just orchids. So we call that a xeric habitat. And here's a range map of the species in its entire occurrence of the continent in cross hatching here. And you can see it just barely gets into southern Indiana. So we're near the northern limit of its range uh, throughout its range. Spiral staircase is referring to the arrangement of flowers on these ladies' tresses orchids. Spiranthes means spiral. Ladies tresses is a name given to it long ago in reference to uh, a, a braid, pattern of a braid. You can see how they just go. Now, not all ladies tresses have such a noticeable spiral because they're compressed. And so you can't see that spiral, but they all still do have that spiral. This particular species has a petal with green, a green lip. See that there and then fringed well, what to me look like tiny, a cluster of tiny rounded jewels. I call that condition jewelaceous. And here shows you the size difference of some of the different ladies' tresses. Like this one is with the largest flowers. And even the largest one, the flowers at most are a quarter inch in length. Let's look at some of the other ones. Uh, here's the showy orchis. This is probably the earliest blooming one, Galliaris, and this, uh, I didn't know what a Gallia was at one time, and you can see this is an old medieval uh, helmet, and there you can see why someone, some botanist came along and said, let's call that Galliaris. It smells, it's very fragrant, but it's so, the whole plant usually is no more than six inches in height, so you'll have to get down on the ground if you want to enjoy its uh, sweet scent. The downy rattlesnake plant. And remember, this is the very first orchid that I ever saw. Good year of pubescence, but it does have flowers in the summer. But you can see the leaves any, any month of the year. And to me, they're quite beautiful uh, pattern leaves. Uh, someone called it a rattlesnake planting because they thought the leaves maybe resembled the shape of a, a, and pattern of a, a head of a rattlesnake. The large world pagonia orchid. I sow to your verticillate. To me, this one almost appears as if it's saying back off, like presenting some threatening pose to some potential predator. Uh, these are nice long sepals. Look at how those are long, a few inches in length. And it has a whorl of leaves. That's the whorled part of the name. Lily leaf tway blade. Tway means two, so two blades, two leaves. It's probably our most common uh, woodland orchid, uh, mostly in edge habitats, not typically in really mature woodland. It only stands a few inches in height. Again, most orchids are very small. Where, where are you tonight? Well, these are ones that are th uh, threatened and endangered ones in Indiana which uh, you see we've got a few of them. So uh, these ones are going to be hard to find, including this one, the green adder's mouth. Malaxis unifolia, unifolia means one leaf, and that's all it has. But it has the tiniest of flowers of all of our native orchids. But here it is uh, quite magnified. It has a very interesting little green flower. But here you can get it, you can appreciate here how tiny those flowers are, those are uh, not much bigger than the head of a pin. And that's its known range in Indiana. And that which is circled is where they're uh, only places where they're still currently can be found and extremely rare. This one's extremely rare, it exists in just a few plants, has just a few individual plants. Prairie we might tip you off why it's rare because, again, as I mentioned earlier about the, the white lady slipper, our prairie habitat is almost totally gone, and as is this orchid. There's the only 
county in the entire state where a few plants can still be found. Uh, and you can see it's primarily in Illinois and southern Michi or Wisconsin and Michigan. And it's ex exceptionally rare in those counties as well. And you, you people remember Hee Haw. This is I searched the world over and you were gone. <laughs> These are ones that no longer occur in Indiana. I've listed the year as well when they were found, last found, known to be found in Indiana. 1983, that was the most recent one for this dragon's mouth orchid. This is a northern uh, species of bogs. And uh, a contemporary of mine at the time when I started working for DNR found it. In fact, that's his picture that he took. And uh, that was it. No more. Same with these other ones. There's still hope, I think, most of all of these to be found in Indiana. This Oklahoma grass pink, it looks a lot like our, our, our uh, tuberous grass pink orchid that we have, that even though it's uncommon, it still exists. This one is very, very similar. And uh, it has been found within, it was formerly found in Indiana, but most recently, uh, last year, it was found. Uh, this last growing season, I should say, I'll back that up, uh, very close to the Indiana-Illinois line. So that's one to keep a, an eye out for. Uh, this is almost 30 years ago now that I, that I wrote this book. Uh, if you go online, people ask me if they can still get it. Uh, many sources consider it out of print and charge you an exorbitant amount of money for it if you willing to do it. I wouldn't because you can go to the Indiana Academy of Science, which is the IT and IU Press are the original publishers of the book, and you can still get this book. And so uh, that's what I would recommend. And uh, this is uh, this little final slide to show that, you know, I did work for the Indiana Division of Nature Preserves and, and uh, if we're truly interested in protecting the orchid flora of Indiana, we need to protect its habitat. Well, that's the case for every, every living wild thing, isn't it? And uh, so I highly recommend you support that program as well as the various land protection organizations called land trusts. Every region of the state has some land trust that uh, serves it. And uh, if you can, uh, can do that, uh, by all means, please do. So that's all I have for you folks tonight. Unless there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. We do have a few questions, Mike. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. I found that fascinating, and I expect many of in our audience did as well. I think that one of the reasons I found it so fascinating is because I realized how little I've been paying attention, and <laughs> I need to definitely open my eyes and pay a lot more attention in the next few months as some of these become available. Um, Kathleen said, this is just a comment, we found Spiranthes ovalis at my Lake County, Illinois stewardship site two years ago, five plants. Didn't see it last year, and we didn't revisit that area this year, but we were excited to see it. Yeah, great. Dawn Marie yeah. said, um, can you buy the orange and purple orchids? And I noticed she was talking when you, she mentioned it when you did the fringed to grow in an Indianapolis garden. And how temperamental are these orchids? Well, I have, to be honest, I haven't had any experience trying to grow any of the native ones. I, but from certainly what all the numbers of people that I've been in contact with over the years, they are finicky and they sometimes need that exact condition in order to grow. And, you know, I mentioned that mycorrhizal fungal association. If that's disturbed, then more often than not, that plant's not going to do well. And so it's best to leave them in the wild. Now, it, it, when I wrote that book 30 years ago, there was practically no success in germinating these wild orchids from seeds. That's changed. It's still not easy. There's also, I guess, tissue culture methodology used to grow some of them, but that doesn't necessarily make them all that much more easily grown in 
uh, in the garden. So uh, I've seen them, some grown successfully. I, I saw someone uh, actually used a bathtub and filled it with uh, sphagnum peat and was able to grow some orchids that way because it was more or less replicating the natural environment in which they grew. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, they're not easy at all. And I strongly do not uh, recommend collecting them or digging them in the wild. Unless you know that that site is absolutely going to be blitzed for development or whatever it might be, do you know maybe a, a rescue sort of effort but uh, otherwise I just I would recommend it just enjoying them in the in the natural environment where they grow. Anna asked are fungus feeding orchids parasitic or do they give something back? I, typically I don't believe and I'm no expert by any means on it I don't think they really have much of a mutualistic association I don't think they really do give the fungus they may but I not that I've, uh, I'm not that well studied of that issue, but from what I have seen, I, I don't think it does. Mary said, in May of last year, I found the leaf of a crane fly orchid in Madison County. If I saw correctly, Madison County was not included in the range map displayed during the lecture. Is there a place where we can find official species range maps and how can we report our findings? Well. The uh, one thing online that's uh, quite helpful is a website. It's called Bonap, B-O-N-A-P. And you can search those, uh, that site, and it has range maps by county for uh, all, all plants known in, in uh, the United States. And... Uh, there is a place there where you can report uh, seeing certain species. Now, if it's a rare endangered species and, and that crane fly isn't in Indiana, then, uh, but if you do see one of those like that I've shown of that list of the, the, uh, the endangered and threatened and endangered ones, then to report that to the uh, Indiana Division of Nature Preserves, the DNR, Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and in particular, the, the botanist there named Scott Namasnik. You wouldn't, you wouldn't happen to necessarily, if you could just get it to the Division of Nature Preserves, he'll, he'll see the information, but he, he particularly will be the one that would, uh, would like to know that information if it's, if it's an endangered or threatened species. Mary said, uh, thanks for presenting tonight. For the coral root orchids, are the mycorrhiza, mycorrhiza fungi associated with any specific trees or other plants? Uh, not that I'm aware. Of. And that's, that's a, uh, an area of study that's still a, is somewhat in its infancy in trying to determine specifically uh, what fungus is important. I think there may be a group of certain types of fungi that they associate with. And, uh, but I, I don't know that there's like a one-to-one -one specific host plant relationship or not. Andrea asked, are there resources to be able to populate some orchids on our own tracts of land? Well, if you go online, you know, you can, you, you can find sources that sell uh, some of these native plants they're from what I've seen they're extremely expensive <laughs> um, if you if you encounter a population that has a lot of seed capsules uh, uh, like for instance that putty root orchid that I, I showed earlier sometimes those colonies where they occur are are uh, significant in number maybe hundreds of plants and you could perhaps take a capsule or two and and shake the seeds on, on your property. But just to add a note to that though, I personally feel it best not to distribute seeds in places outside of their known range. Uh, it just, it doesn't fit. You know, it, it, 
I believe in, in that the uh, there's a reason certain species occur where they do and in ranges that they do. And uh, I'd rather not see them taken somewhere far distant from where they're known to occur and get them established there. I, I, that, uh, that's my opinion about it anyway. Shannon asked, how can I protect rare orchids that I find? Well, if it's on, if it's on your own property, then by all means, try to keep that environment uh, intact as best you can. Uh, exotic species, native, non-native invasive species are a threat, not only to orchids, but all sorts of uh, native plants. And I'd recommend not allowing those to proliferate. They could certainly diminish an orchid population. And, uh, and again, join one of these land trusts or other natural area protecting organizations, the Nature Conservancy as a statewide organization. And uh, in central Indiana, you know, there's the Central Indiana Land Trust and in south there's the Sycamore Land Trust. So niches up in the north, uh, northwest, there's a bunch of them. Uh, try to research that and join one of those organizations and help, uh, help to uh, protect uh, natural areas and, and to manage them properly. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question if you're up for it. Um, Michael said, I've not seen a tway blade in several years after seeing them frequently. Have you noticed this? Well, that's one thing about orchids. They sometimes can be rather ephemeral and tway blade orchid would be one of those. They don't seem to stick around too long, uh, at least any given individual plant. And uh, they may pop up though, not far away. Uh, they don't like super dense shade. Uh, if, if, uh, if you're on an edge habitat, uh, I've seen them grow in full sun. They don't normally grow in full sun, but they can. I've seen that. They usually like just, just dappled uh, shade. And, uh, you know, most orchids like as much light as you can give them without being too much. <laughs> so you don't, those you know, forest orchids, they'll like some light if you can give them some light. But uh, dense shades, typically not the best thing for them but nor is full sun. Uh, just, it just depends on the species. Well, it's uh, eight o'clock, so I think we'll wrap things up now. Uh, thank you again, Mike, for taking the time to share your expertise with us. Again, I found it very interesting, and I think many of our audience did too, based on the, question, the, the comments I'm seeing in the chat. You might take a look at those yourself, Mike. Uh, several people said hello oh, um, that you may, you may know well. And I want to thank all of our audience for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any interest in forestry or you are a woodland owner, we welcome you to look at our website, ifwoa.org, and learn more about our organization. I will be sending out a follow-up message to let you know when the recording is available and also with a little bit of information on some upcoming events that might also be of interest to you, including the next webinars that we have. The next one is in February on uh, being tick aware. So um, I hope you all have a good evening and uh, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks. And thank you. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate your time and interest. Thanks, Mike. Very nice. Thank you. Those pictures were amazing. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. I can all. imagine it takes a little bit of work to get the picture that that good on such a small object. <laughs> well, some certainly, and I'm not an expert photographer, but uh, and some of those really, really good pictures were not mine, but uh, I, I try. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We'll Good see night. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Judy. Thanks a lot. I can't. I can't.